Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the GeoDiv second online lecture. Today's lecture is titled Centrifuge Modeling of Powered Foundations in Swelling Clays, which is the PhD thesis of Dr. Tiago Gasper. Just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Today's lecture, we're looking at about 40 to 50 minutes, after which we'll open up Q&A. We'll probably allow 20, 25 minutes for Q&A, depending how time goes. There are CPD points for attending today's lecture. There will be an attendance register that I will post in the Q&A section. It'll be a link to an office form. Please complete the form and submit it as this will be used for crediting CPD points. Okay, if I can introduce Dr. Gaspar. The path taken by Dr. Tiago Gaspar into the field of geotechnical engineering is perhaps unconventional when compared to a lot of his peers. Whereas many geotechnicals in geotechnical engineers often report an interest in the subject from a young age, what led Tiago to study engineering was simply a curiosity in the sciences and the fact that as a teenager, he met a civil engineer who appeared to have a pretty interesting job and daughter, and yet managed to go on hikes every other weekend. For this reason, he decided to study civil engineering at the University of Pretoria. However, it was not till his first soil mechanics lecture enthusiastic, enthusiastically presented by Prof. Gerard Heyman that he instantly knew what direction his career would take. In the final year of his undergraduate studies, another extremely enthusiastic geotechnical engineer, Prof. Jacobs, introduced him into the field of unsaturated soil mechanics. From that point on, Tiago was hooked and continued to work under the supervision of Prof. Jacobs in his final year, straight through to his PhD. During this period, Tiago investigated various aspects of unsaturated soil mechanics, contributing substantially to the unsaturated testing capabilities of the UP laboratory. During his postgrad studies, Tiago wrote several technical papers and presented his work at a number of international conferences. For his PhD research, Tiago was afforded the opportunity to contribute towards the Wind Africa Research Project. Being a collaborative project between several international universities and industry partners, Tiago has been able to collaborate and learn from some of the greatest minds in geotechnical engineering and unsat unsaturated soil mechanics. <coughs> Excuse me. While his PhD research focused on element testing and centrifuge modeling, his current role as a postdoctoral research associate at Durham University involves the development of an unsaturated constitutive model that is being used to simulate the experimental work completed through his doctoral research. With that, Dr. Gaspar, I hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Um, yes, so um, as mentioned, I'll be presenting this topic, which was the uh, topic of my PhD thesis. And while I am currently at Durham, it was this work was undertaken at the University of Pretoria. And um, yes, yeah, so I'll just sort of jump into things here. Actually, before I get started on what this lecture is actually about, some of you who attended the first lecture of this year may recognize this slide. It was something that uh, Charles McRobert started off with in his presentation, which essentially just shows your areas of physics by difficulty and progressively getting harder to the right, with sand plotting just, just above quantum mechanics. And this is a meme that I was quite familiar with because I was saying something very similar towards the end of my doctoral studies, but it was slightly amended to look something like this. Now, if you look here towards the right, we've got clay in the far end. This is obviously a very accurate representation of what clay looks like. You can see all the individual clay platelets there. And this little mess on the right here is essentially what I'll be speaking about today, or the essential theme of this lecture. So, if you're looking at swelling clays, um, there are very many reported instances in, in the literature that speak about the economic implications and all the problems that it's caused over many decades, but I figured everyone really knows that, so I'll just put a photo here of precisely what we don't want to happen, um, because with these swelling and shrinking clays, during your wetter seasons, clay swells, during the drier seasons, it shrinks and cracks, and this seasonal differential movement creates um, basically a lot, of, a lot of problems for whatever structure lies above. So for this reason, it's, it's something that I believe is worth looking into. And yes, um, as mentioned as well in the introduction, I looked in 
to unsaturate the soil mechanics throughout from my final year up until my PhD, but it wasn't until the start of my PhD that I actually found this out, which was that South Africa actually was one of the first countries to embark on research in expansive flows, which is a very active area of research in unsaturated soils. And I was able to get my hands on this gem, uh, this, the first symposium on expansive flows, which was held in South Africa in '57. And it's very interesting to see where things started because many of the of the concepts and points raised in this uh, symposium are still as applicable today as they were all those decades ago. So that was just a nice bit of history that I, I learned during this whole process. Now, for this project, I looked at piled foundations and expansive planes. Obviously, there are there are other options. You don't need to use piled foundations and expansive planes, but this was the focus of of my particular study. So what I've indicated here is we've got a mass of clay. Uh, I've indicated what the active zone is here, and what this is is essentially it's usually the upper x number of meters of the profile that is susceptible to this volumetric change that I described. So this is the part of the profile that will swell, essentially. And if you're going to design pile foundations in this, what you might do is get some piles that extend down into more competent material or into bedrock if, if that's not too deep, so that you can kind of stabilize whatever structures above it. This can be, these piles can then be joined by whatever pile cap, the beam, the slab, whatever. And the idea is that this stabilizing force, the bottom of the piles, can isolate the structure from any movements happening in the clay. You also provide a bit of a gap between your ground level and the bottom of the clay slab. The intention being that if the soil does swell, there's a bit of an allowance for it to swell into a gap without pushing up against the structure and causing problems. Of course, also during this whole, even if you take all these precautions, you do get some uplift forces induced in the piles, which is also something that, that's worth investigating and, and trying to understand. So this is essentially the, the type of foundation that, that I had in mind for this project, for this research project. So I mentioned, or Brett mentioned the Wind Africa research project in my introduction, and it's a specific, quite a specific case, but it, it was what provided the emphasis for this research. And essentially, the story goes that with the drive towards renewable energy, um, wind turbines are becoming quite an attractive option to explore and, and to use throughout the world. However, many portions of Africa are underlain by expansive clay. So this is an issue if you ever decide you want to build such a tall and slender structure on a clay that misbehaves as much as this one does, because you've got a very tall and slender structure with very large lateral forces at the top, creating overturning moments at your foundation. And this combined with your seasonal swelling and shrinking of your clay is obviously problematic, especially if you consider these tight tolerances that you have for these structures, it's a bit of an issue. And so this, this Wind Africa research project was born. And it, the idea was to involve a number of universities throughout Africa and in the UK, and for each university to look at a certain aspect, a certain work package, and to investigate various aspects of this type of problem. Now, while that was what provided the emphasis for the research, I think a lot of the conclusions and the findings are, are actually a lot more widely applicable, not just for wind turbines, but hopefully there's something that um, new, something new that comes out of this for for a lot of other people. Okay, so if you're looking at the background of testing expansive clays, well, actually, testing soils is already a, a, a difficult thing to do correctly, but if you're testing expansive clays, I think things get a little bit even more difficult because you end up with a very, or you're starting off with a very fissured profile that looks something like this on the right. And, um, oh sorry, actually, let me take a step back. One thing that I should actually point out is that due to the mineralogy of these soils, they have a very low hydraulic conductivity. So it takes very a very long time for moisture to actually get into the clay. And in fact, uh, there's been some full, full scale studies. I'm citing one now from 91 where a uh, full scale test showed that swell continued for a period of 10 years. And while it was a very good and interesting study, it becomes a bit impractical to have to wait 10 years to, to investigate um, whatever it is that you're interested in between tests. So that's one issue. Another issue is that if you're looking at element testing, generally your sample size 
or generally always, your sample size is too small to capture your in-situ fabric. So usually what will happen is you'll go to your site and cut out a very nice little block sample that forms very nicely in between all of these fissures, which immediately then you have a bias towards stronger samples. So whatever results you're getting from the laboratory is a little bit misleading in that respect. But also the fact that you've not taken or if you're not, you've not incorporated this fissured fabric into whatever sample you're testing, it'll be very difficult to get water into that material, into that sample. And if you're looking at your unsaturated soil properties, which is what is key in this type of research, you want to know how this soil is going to respond to changes in water content. So a situation where you've got an element of soil without any fissures that it's very difficult to get water into, that's obviously problematic. And something that needed to be looked at. Then finally, you get centrifuge modeling. Now this, I think, provides sort of an in-between between your, your large-scale testing and your element testing, because you end up with a bigger sample size, which means you can incorporate some amount of fabric, although not as much as you can on full scale. But it also has the benefit of you have more control over your boundary conditions in comparison to what you would in a full-scale test, because you know exactly what you're putting in that box. Well. I say exactly, you know mostly what you're putting in that box and what the boundary conditions are and how you can interpret the data. But another thing that, that's still an issue is your rate of swell, because as I've mentioned, it's very dependent on the fissure fabric. You need some of this to get moisture in in the first place to cause the swell, which is um, something that I'd need to accomplish if I wanted to investigate the effect of swell on a pile foundation. So. That was sort of the jumping off point for this project. And so I had to then develop a material or sample preparation procedure and characterize that to see if what I prepared was at all realistic and representative of what we find on site. So just to give everyone an idea of the type of material we're dealing with here, you can see very high PI, very high, you know, highly active, very plastic material. And there's a bunch of properties that I've listed here, but I just want to draw your attention to two things. Firstly, we visited this site a number of times over uh, during my PhD, and I think the lowest degree of saturation that we measured was, was somewhere around 85%. It never dropped below that, so quite close to saturation. Um, so that, that, that's one thing that I found quite interesting. This bottom point here, this, uh, this symbol that I've used is to designate suction. And the metric suction that was measured on the site was between two and a half and four megapascals. And I repeat, megapascals. That's the type of suction that this clay is able to sustain. And if you consider the fact that that is essentially what, it's largely what's driving your soil process, you, you only need to look at that to realize what capacity and what potential expansiveness you're dealing with here. Okay. So now, if you're looking at the sample preparation procedure that were, was explored, what I did was took an intact lump of clay, as you can see on the left there, used this extremely sophisticated piece of equipment at the top, which you might all have seen in your kitchen, and after very many hours of manual labor, ended up with a material that looked a bit like that, very um, suspect cheese. And then that clay, was statically compacted into a, a slab, which you can see on the right here. This slab, I also should mention, sorry, that this was graded at its in situ moisture content, and this slab was compacted back to the in situ density that was measured on site. So the idea being that theoretically, we've kept the water content and suction the same, we've kept the uh, density the same, we should get similar, uh, similar behavior when compared to undisturbed samples. But I'd like to test that. Uh, yeah, this is just a close-up photo where you can actually see how there are some, well, it's, it's not quite as fissured as what things are on site, but you can see that there are flow parts in here, which is exactly what I wanted. And this allows for some moisture to get into the clay so that we can get that swell that I'm trying to investigate. Then in the development and characterization, I decided that there was three things that I was going to look at. You can obviously test endlessly on these materials, but I figured that if you want to design on this, probably the two most important things that you'd be interested in 
uh, or two very important things rather is just the swell potential. So how much is this clay actually is it going to swell uh, over the period of or over the lifetime of the structure, and also what the swell pressure is. So what pressure is actually required to prevent swell? Because if the overlying structure is heavy enough to suppress swell, you have a low swell pressure, don't really need to worry about much. Um, then finally, I'll mention soil with retention curves here. This is, um, for anyone who's not familiar with unsaturated soil mechanics, this presents the relationship between suction and degree of saturation. And it was actually the topic of the last Jennings lecture by uh, Prof. Fredland. And essentially, you can really get a lot of a lot of information from these curves. And so if you, if you have to choose one test to perform on an unsaturated soil, that's the one that, that you want to do. Okay, so soil potential, this is a relatively straightforward test. There's usually, there, there's three approaches that I'm aware of that, that you can use to do this. And I looked at two of the three. And what was done here, I'm plotting volumetric strain on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal. A sample was taken uh, from, you know, the understood sample, trimmed down, put in the odometer at its institute, moisture content and density, uh, a predetermined stress was applied on top of it, and the odometer was then flooded and the sample was allowed to swell. So this test is for a sample which had 12 and a half kilopascals on it, and by the end of testing it had swelled around 10%. This was then repeated for a number of different overburden stresses to see um, what, how this varies, how this would vary to the depth of your profile is one reason you might want to do this. And you can see that as you increase your overburden stress, the amount of swell reduces, as you might expect. But then at some point, you get compression of a sample as you inundate it. And then between these two values is that swell pressure parameter that I, I mentioned earlier. So the, the pressure required to completely prevent swell, I could see from this was somewhere between four and five hundred kilobits, well, according to this graph at least. Um, but another way to look at this data is to plot what's referred to as a swell under load curve. So the way that this is done is you again have volumetric strain on the vertical axis, but now you've got an applied vertical stress in the horizontal. And what is done is you take the end point of a test and you plot a little discrete marker there at the correct overburden stress. You repeat this for the rest of the test and you get this swell under load curve. This is quite a nice way of looking at it because it allowed me to compare how the undisturbed samples behaved in comparison to the compacted sample. And what I can see from this, I was quite happy with, is that the properties are, were pretty similar. So the amount of swell that you got at various overburden stresses was quite similar, and the swell pressure that you got, if you calculated it using these linear regression curves, was also quite similar, between 329 and 375 kPa. Obviously there is scatter because the end of the day, this is just soil, but by and large, a good result. Well, and then I was very proud of actually, and then I read a little bit further and found out that someone discovered this long before I was born and uh, buried somewhere. I can't remember what library I got this from or who I got it from, but Brackley essentially saw something very similar in '83 where there was no difference between swell of undisturbed and remolded samples provided you kept your initial conditions the same. And the hypothesis that he gave for this was that you have to realize that your swelling clays over many years will undergo many swelling and shrinking cycles over and over again. And over very many years, this results in you having a fairly remolded structure in situ. The implications of that are that whatever you do to it after you've taken it from the site to the lab, you or unlikely to change a lot of its characteristics. I mean, you definitely can, but you're unlikely to, provided that you keep your initial conditions the same. And that was something that Bracky found quite some time ago, but good to see that, that he's still right. Um, so I mentioned that there were three methods to investigate this. I've presented one now on the left. Uh, this is an ACM standard. Uh, well, this is the relevant ACM standard, but the other method is something that was reported in that first symposium on expansive clays that I spoke about. As it turns out, um, ASM obviously also have a standard for that, but 
always nice to to reference Professor Jennings in your presentations. So essentially the way that this test works is a sample is allowed to swell under a low seating stress. And then you, so in this case, for example, the 12 and a half kilopascals allowed to swell under that stress. And then just the conventional consolidation test was performed and it was loaded, saturated. So those two points, take it over to that graph, they were loaded in a fully saturated state and then unloaded at some point. If you look at this graph, sorry, um, the soil pressure again was between 300 and 400 kPa, similar finding to what we got from the first test, which is good news, reassuring that what I've measured seems to be realistic and gave me a bit more confidence in this. Um, all right, so I've mentioned now that after these tests were performed, I did some consolidation tests. Now, this is something that I repeated for all of these samples for a number of reasons. But the one reason was uh, to investigate the effects of soil structure. Because you can imagine if you go and collect samples from sites and you start tinkering with it in the lab, structure is one of the first things that you are likely to change. So despite the fact that in original, the, the preliminary results showed that this wasn't an issue, decided to investigate it a bit further to be sure. So to describe this, I'm just going to refer to a paper that was published in 1990, where I'm now plotting just a normal uh, conventional consolidation test. If you take uh, a reconstituted sample or a destructured soil, so something that's been mixed at between its liquid limit and 1.5 times its liquid limit, you'll get a diagonal line, essentially. And this will separate possible from impossible states. And if you then did a, a consolidation test on an undisturbed sample, what you might expect is it to follow a flatter slope and then finally hit this curve and traverse that normal consolidation line. But what actually happens for structured soils is you get something like that, where your sample ventures into seemingly impossible stress states. And what this study showed all that time ago was that this area is not physics breaking down, it's just called structure permitted space. Um, and allowing your soil to possess some structure and bonding gives it the ability to exist in seemingly impossible stress states. So if you get a result like this, you can be, it's sort of a warning light that you may have to deal with some effects on the structured soil. Okay, so here are all of the consolidation tests that were formed on the compacted samples. The dotted black line is that reconstituted sample that I've mentioned. And as you can see here, everything lies within permissible stress states. So probably might have expected that, but good news. Also worth noting that your compression indices as, the, as you go to higher stresses are tending to converge towards similar values. The slope seems to be very similar as you approach higher stresses. Same with your expansion indices, which is also quite um, assuring. If you then look at your undisturbed samples, though, something funny happens. Most of these samples existed in permissible stress states, which was good news because that's behaving exactly as, or well, very similar to the way that the compacted samples were. But there I've got two samples existing in structure permitted space. So to me, the question was, why am I seeing this for only two of, of the samples? Uh, what's the reason? Because if, if there is a structural effect that I need to be taking into account, I need to understand what's going on. But if you look back at the stress paths followed for these tests, you can identify what's going on here because these two tests plot there on this graph that I presented previously. So these are the two samples that were allowed to swell under overburden stresses of two and 400 kPa. And I'm just gonna jump forward quickly here. This is a quote from this paper where they spoke about how it may be more logical to consider yield of a structure as a function of strain or strain energy. So in other words, what's important is not so much how much stress or load you apply to this, what matters is how much has it strained. So for the first couple of samples, we're getting strains of 10%, 8%, so on and so forth. But once I restricted my volumetric strain to a certain amount, the sample didn't swell as much and therefore some of the structure was preserved. So now that I understand the mechanism, took a step back to see what the implications of this might be for the centrifuge tests, which I promise are still coming up. 
But the implication is that it actually it didn't it doesn't matter for the test that I was going to perform because these are stresses that weren't going to be achieved in my model. So we're looking, I said here, two and four hundred kPa. That's not those stress levels are a lot higher than what was considered in the centrifuge model. Okay, so that's that. Then one last thing on the element testing is soil water retention curves. So I mentioned this earlier. It's a very useful thing to measure if you're interested in unsaturated soil properties. And I'm not going to speak too much about it because I think Prof. Redland spoke about it quite well and outlined, I think, everything you need to know in his Jennings lecture. But what I will point out here, so I've got two graphs on the left is some raw data on the right of some best fit curves. I did this for a range of samples, compacted, undisturbed, reconstituted, all of them. Um, but the only takeaway that I have from this, that, that I'd like you to take, take away from these graphs, is that I mentioned that the degree of saturation we're dealing with was around 80% and higher. Now, if you're looking at the suction values that you're achieving in this range, it's several megapascals. This is higher than the two and a half megapascals I mentioned before. Um, but this, in this case, I'm measuring total suction rather than metric suction. I won't go into those differences now. The point is, it's, we're dealing with megapascals of suction at a very high degree of saturation. So just because something is very close to saturation doesn't mean it can't swell. OK, so centrifuge modeling, as promised. The reason that you might want to do this, I, I mentioned a few earlier, but here's three uh, important things. Firstly, soil behavior is highly nonlinear which means that the stress applied by your soft weight is very important. And the implications of this are that if I were to go and construct a model, which is 250 moles in height, as this one was, and then decided to test some scaled uh, pile foundations in that, the stress levels that I'd be testing at would be completely incorrect. However, if I take that 250 mole deep profile, put it in the strong box, and swing it in the geotechnical centrifuge at 30 G, as I did, um, it then becomes representative of a seven and a half meter profile. Your stress state is a lot closer to reality, and then you can actually start testing some, some valuable things. And because you're testing at the correct stress state, it can allow for validation of numerical modeling, which is something that uh, you'd obviously very much like to do. And yeah, so that's a justification for that. Just some Back on the tests that were done, they were all performed at 50 G. There were quite a few that were performed. A lot of tests were repeated at an unswelled and a swelled state. So I'll refer to a swelled and an unswelled, an unswelled and a swelled state throughout this presentation. What I mean by that is that the unswelled state is as the clay is at its in situ moisture conditions, in situ density, and yeah, so that's that's what that means. Swelled state is after we had allowed well uh, estimated by a fundamentalist prediction method for a very highly expensive potential uh, high, sorry, very highly potential I forgetting what exactly what the thing is now and apparently I can't say it but you get my point it's fundamentalist swell prediction method and that was used as a baseline for the swell state for all the tests that were done in the study and again here's some initial properties um, Okay, so first test that was done, greenfield test. No power foundations, because we needed to see how exactly this clay was going to behave in the geotechnical centrifuge and um, to see if it, you know, if it could be trusted in any way. What this model looked like, uh, it consisted of five 50 millimeter clay layers separated by geotextiles. This allowed or facilitated a more rapid ingress of moisture into the profile. It had surface LVDTs, extensometers at different depths. This entire thing was then placed in the geotechnical centrifuge, spun up to 30 G, and it was flooded from the base. And there were these two water wells adjacent to the profile. As the water level rises, it then flows into these geotextiles, and you're able to get moisture into the profile a lot quicker. I actually can't stress how vital this thing was. It seems quite small now, but if we couldn't get swell, if we couldn't get this clay to swell, nothing else that I present from here on out would have been possible. So this was quite an important test and it's I suppose a bit embarrassing how long it took me to try and figure this out, but it worked in the end. Um, also did some 
TPTs before and after allowing swell to occur, see what the penetration resistance looked like before and after swell, also had some moisture and suction sensors, and this is what the profile looked like from the front. That's what it looked like from the top. And you can see some RVTs there, the CPT, and a bunch of other interesting things. Okay, in flight swell, this work was something that was presented in Iceland in 2019. But the gist of the paper is this. Uh, I've got the profile on the right here. This is a photograph, obviously. On the left, this is a height above base of my strong box. So this model actually sat on a heel base over here somewhere, and then plotting swell on the horizontal axis, and swell was measured at these points. So, what we measured was, that was the amount of swell that occurred at three hours, that's what was measured at five, that's what was measured at 20, and if I then compared it to fundamental prediction method, there we go, I'm not gonna try to read that out, that's what I meant earlier, uh, but it compared very well with fundamental prediction method. Um, and what I'm referring to here specifically is the trend. If you look at the trend of the profile, not overly concerned with the actual magnitude of swell, because as you can see, if I left this thing swelling for a longer period of time, I exceeded fundamental swell. And if I left it for a little bit shorter period of time, I would have gotten a bit less. But uh, what I was quite interested to see was the fact that the profile was correct, which is reassuring. Um, yeah, so I've now mentioned this. I'm actually going to quickly take a step aside from the core theme of this lecture to speak about empirical prediction methods, because I've mentioned fundamental as well now. And something that I learned during my PhD, which I, I didn't expect to learn, was that there are a few things as divisive as um, as asking someone what the preferred empirical prediction method is. People, I've noticed that if I say this in the wrong circle, people get quite... Um, enthusiastic about their views on the use of Fanova or all the rest of it, all these other methods. So just as a quick point on this entire issue, I'm looking now quickly at Fanova versus Jones versus Western, two of Brackley's methods. And for the same say, profile, which we characterized, I, I'd say quite well, quite extensively, I'd imagine, uh, this is the, the spread of data that you get. So you choose your prediction method, you choose your answer, obviously. Um, and the message that I'm trying to get here is that they, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. I'm, tell, I'm saying things that I think everybody already knows, but it doesn't hurt to remind people um, that they're all estimation methods at the end of the day. And um, some of them incorporate parameters that others don't. Sometimes it makes it a bit better. Sometimes it just introduces another parameter that you can get wrong. Uh, but by and large, they all have their strengths and weaknesses, so we can really all just get along when it comes to these types of things. And this is a quote that I've presented on this type of thing before, which is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. But on that note, I'll get back to what I should be talking about, which is the centrifuge models that were, that were conducted. I also use uh, suction and water content sensors. I think I mentioned this previously. This is what they look like. Water content sensor on the left and the suction sensor on the right. These were pushed into the back of the slabs and that was backfilled with clay. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about these because you flood the profile, the suction drops from 2.5 megapascals to zero is what happened. Um, but these are interesting sensors and worth looking into. And if it's something that you are interested in looking into, um, my friend Rick has just well, submitted his PhD not too long ago, I don't think, and he looked at this in a great amount of detail. So he'll uh, be able to describe a lot better than I can what the strengths and weaknesses of these sensors are. I unfortunately had to report that many of these sensors had to die in the making of this PhD, but that, that may have just been me uh, mishandling it. But yeah, so that's, those are the sensors. That's the reference if you'd like to read more on that. Okay, CPTs. So this is the CPT that was used for in-flight penetration tests. The way it was designed was it had an 8 millimeter, 6 degree conical tip. An inner rod that transferred load from the tip through to this load tile at the back. This was housed within a um, steel tube, a shaft, and Oh, sorry, that's the load tile. 
that this will house it within a tube, and that tube was designed to thrust against this block here. The reason for that is that I wanted to measure only tip resistance and no shaft resistance, and after many calibrations, find out that this was exactly the case, and so I could be confident in whatever readings I got from this um, CDT. So I'm going to show you a quick video now that was recorded at 30G in the centrifuge on the right here. You can just about make out where the CPT is. I've highlighted it red. And on the left, I've got uh, penetration resistance in the horizontal axis versus penetration depth. So if I play this, at some point, that CPT will start moving, then it goes. And as it hits the clay, uh, you'll see some results popping up on the left here. And a couple of things that we can tell from this, which I will explain now. The first thing is that um, if you look at your penetration test that was performed at the in-situ moisture content of the clay, we have quite consistent penetration resistances for each slab, which is just an indication of how expertly prepared these samples were. Um, yeah, they were really prepared very meticulously. And that's me giving myself a, a bit of a self five there. But you can also see how you achieve your highest penetration resistance within the center of the slab, then as you push out the other end, it drops, and so on and so forth. If you then look at penetration resistances after the soil was allowed to swell, again, you can see uh, the different layers, but perhaps more importantly is how much it's softened after allowing swell to occur. And the majority of the swell occurred, as you might expect, in the upper portions of the profile. So that was the Greenfield centrifuge test. Now, finally, we start to get to some piling uh, stuff as promised. The question at hand was pull out capacity of piles, the shaft resistance of piles. How does this vary in an expansive play profile where you've got changing water contents and changing pressures and all the rest of it? It's a bit of a complicated problem because you get an increase in lateral pressure during swell, but this is accompanied by softening. So these, you have these two contradictory mechanisms, and the question then becomes which one, um, which one dominates, which one's going to dominate your behavior. Uh, if you look at the literature, there have been some discrepancies. A uh, study by Pop Bright in 84 indicated that pull-out capacity increased after swell. A similar study conducted in Sudan illustrates that pull-out capacity decreased after swell, so no help there. Uh, this was something that we wanted to have a look at. And so this test layout looked, again, very similar to the Greenfield test, except that um, there were four concrete or grouted piles that were cast into the profile, essentially augured a hole, poured some of the stuff down, allowed it to cure, and then put this entire thing to the centrifuge, spun it up to 30G. Once achieving the desired acceleration, pulled out the first two and measured uh, measure the, the force required to do so, as well as displacement, then um, flooded the whole strong box, waited for fundamental swell, and then pulled out the second two. And the results of this test can be summarized quite quickly like this. This is some work that Khadet actually presented in 2019. And the crux of this paper was that that's what your average shaft friction was before swell had occurred. That's what it was after swell, after fundamental swell. Um, so, average shaft friction versus displacement. This study essentially shows that you get quite a dramatic reduction in your shaft capacity and shaft friction after allowing swell to occur. The issue with this result, though, is that it contradicts what I thought I found. And when something like that happens, I tend to, to question myself and go back to the drawing board. And so, a few more tests needed to be done. Therefore, looked at some concrete plug pull-out tests. So, these are just short length piles, which looked something like this. Very similar test setup, except now three tests were performed. The first test, this entire thing spun up to 30G, and all four were pulled out at the closed institute moisture content. Then a second test was performed, entirely new model, four new plug, put in a centrifuge, spun up to 30G, flooded with moisture, uh, with water, and the four plugs were pulled out. Now, I've mentioned here that the holes were unsupported. I'm referring to the hole, the organ hole behind the plug here. So, clay was actually allowed to swell behind the plug. And this was something that 
I was actually, I wanted to know if this would have an effect on the flight capacity. So a third test was conducted where the holes were supported. And just to show you how that was done, uh, I'm just going to zoom into that bit of the test. An aluminium tube was pushed into the hole and until it met with the short length pile, then it was pulled back five millimeters and anchored at the top of the profile. This five mil gap was more than enough for the peak shaft friction to be mobilized during a test. And so this kind of achieved what, what I needed it to. If you now look at a summary of these results, I've again got a photograph on the right and on the left here, the peak shaft friction, and horizontal axis and overload and stress on the vertical. If you look at the first two tests, before swell and after swell, of unsupported holes, you see that you do get that reduction um, in peak shaft friction or shaft capacity, or plot capacity, whatever you want to call it. You do get that reduction for three of the four piles. However, at depth, you get a slight increase in collect capacity. So this was quite interesting. And what it points towards is that at depth, where you suppress swell, you also suppress swell-induced softening. And for that reason, the increase in lateral pressure tends to dominate uh, what's going on. If you then compare those to uh, tests conducted with supported holes, very similar results. So this again shows us two things. Firstly, it shows that the material that swelled behind the plug had no effect in the reading, which I suppose makes sense. It's a very low density material after it's swelled. Um, and it also shows uh, or it provides some confidence in the repeatability of the test, which I was quite happy to see. Um, I, I think very rarely do you repeat two centrifuge tests and get data to match. Um, yeah, to match because things go wrong at 30G, essentially. So this was quite reassuring. However, the issue is that with pull-out tests, you're essentially me uh, you're measuring the consequence of two conflicting mechanisms, and it's far more valuable to measure variations in lateral pressure during swell. So on that note, another test was done, which was an instrumented pile test. And the instrumented pile looked something like this. It was an aluminium pile with lateral load cells at various depths. The idea was to have these um, lateral load cells at the center of every place uh, slab so that I could measure variations in lateral pressure throughout the swell process. If you want to look at what these load cells looked like, uh, here's a bunch of photos. Looks like a little dumbbell, really, um, and a bunch of different views. If you look at the far right here, the way this was instrumented, a uh, very basic representation is that Rosette strain gauge on either side of the load cell was then wired into a full weak point bridge, and that allowed us to then measure um, changes in lateral pressure against the pile. This is an idea that I saw from Dr. Alcott's PhD, um, and yeah, it was good to know that it still works quite well. This is what the test looked like, similar with the five slabs and geotextiles again. The difference here is that there was a single aluminium pile installed in the center with lateral load cells at the center of every slab. Um, the pile was also anchored at its base. So the reason for that was just to, I didn't want the pile to be moving around during this test because I wanted to be able to interpret this data with a, with a bit more clarity and didn't need that extra variable in the mix. Um, so these are the results. What's been done here is it's been color coded on the right to this pile. So the bottom load cell is in black. You can see that line over there. Blue load cell is over there. That's the top one. Um, now, the first thing I should say is that these results, I'm plotting now changes in lateral pressure versus the average surface swell that occurred for the entire profile. So throughout the swell process. But what I want to point out is I, I would look at these results as being more qualitative than quantitative because um, during the installation of this pile, you have to auger a hole, obviously. That hole needs to be slightly bigger than the pile for you to get it in. And then when you push it into place, you know, obviously disturb some of your material, widen the top of the hole a little bit, increase the gap more in some places than you do in others. And that will then affect the, the magnitude of soil that you get. Having said that, the overall trends are quite useful and, and quite insightful, I think, because what it shows is that at the beginning of a swell process, you get your increases in natural pressure, 
and at the end of the swap process, after you've allowed a lot of swaps to occur, you get a reduction in natural pressures. Now, why why is this so interesting? Because if you look back at um, the two pieces of literature that I mentioned previously, the flight recorded increases after swell, uh, increases in, in shock capacity, and also reef recorded reductions. Now, after doing this test, I went back and looked at those papers, and there was one thing that was, one key thing that was quite different about these two studies, and that the period that the profile was waited for. So, Prof. Light inundated the entire profile for three to four weeks, and then the pull-out tests were conducted, whereas with al Sharif, the profile was soaked for a period of about two months before any testing was done. If you then look at this graph, it's quite likely that Prof. Light was testing somewhere in this region at relatively low levels of swell. Um, and so the increases in natural pressure was the dominate, dominating mechanism, whereas Osharif was testing a lot later in the swell process when swell-induced softening becomes the dominant mechanism. And so from, from this result, you can see that if you're actually interested in what the shaft capacity is going to be, um, and you're building in a swelling clay, what's, what's quite important is how much swell do you anticipate? Because that that will affect the answer. Now, I realize that, that that's a difficult question in and of itself, but it's one that needs to be taken into account if you if you want to understand what's going to happen with your um, shaft capacity. So yes, um, I'm going to conclude now with a couple of things. The first set of conclusions that I have is more for testing and perhaps more from a research perspective, but in developing the scaled fissure profile, it is possible to allow a lot of swell to occur within a reasonable time frame, which is necessary if you want to investigate the various aspects of power foundations, which I did quite a few as I presented today, but it's something that will still be ongoing at UP, and it's something that we can now take forward. Another thing that was interesting to note is that preparation procedure Firstly, it doesn't really significantly alter your swell properties if you keep your initial conditions the same, which is reassuring because it uh, avoids having to get undisturbed samples. And also, another finding is that your preparation procedure, preparation procedure doesn't really affect your structure any more than swell does, because swell uh, obviously produces a lot of strain, and that will will destroy the structure quite effectively. You're then looking at your pull-out and shaft capacity. If you're considering full-length piles produced after allowing swell to occur, in fact, I should actually add here, you're used to allowing a lot of swell to occur because everything was tested at fundamental swell. It may well be that if these tests were conducted earlier on in the process, you could have gotten an increase. Um, and then the second point is that it's dependent on the depth in the profile. So if you go deeper into the profile where your swell is suppressed by overburden pressure, um, you can get local increases in your lateral pressure at depth. And finally, uh, the development of swell induced lateral stresses against the pile, it's time dependent, or rather it's dependent on the magnitude of the swell which has occurred. And you can get a reduction of swell induced pressure at high confining stresses. So basically the message there is that if you want to know, <laughs> I think the overall message of these last two points is Identify how much swell you expect to occur at whatever point in time or whatever point throughout your profile, and that is going to strongly affect what will happen to the shaft capacity as your soil swell. Now, just on a final note, just way forward here, because this is something my PhD has done, but the work is carrying on, and just show you guys some interesting things. So, there's actually some large scale field testing that I think was completed last year. And um, quite a lot of interesting things have been happening there. This is just a uh, photograph of one bit of the site where we have a hydraulic jack that's cyclically loading these two free-ended piles, as well as that um, that those two those are two piles joined by a pile cap, and we are measuring the cyclic response of these these piles at full scale or at, at large scale testing. Also, have an instrumented full-length pile with fiber optic cables looking at the induced uplift forces generated during the swell process. Also, the pull-out test that I mentioned for the centrifuge test have been repeated on site. Um, 
So that's something that's happening. The numerical modeling, which is something that I've now taken over, building on the work of Tim, a friend of mine, who was at Durham before. That's also underway. And then finally, for the element testing is will be conducted, which will involve a lot of unsaturated triaxial tests, monotonic and cyclic, to really try and investigate how this material behaves. And then finally, acknowledgement. Um, obviously, my PhD supervisor, Prof Jakobs, guided a lot of this. Dr. Kenneth Smith, I uh, can't emphasize how much he helped with this. All of the centrifuge tests that you see, uh, that you saw today, he was an integral part of. To Prof Heyman, is always very helpful, very fruitful discussions. Uh, since coming over to the UK, been able to speak to a lot of other professors, Ashraf Osman, David Toll, and your gems. I find it quite interesting how there's some people that you can speak to with and have a five five minute conversation with that makes you question the last six months of work. And I think I think most of the people I've mentioned on this slide actually fit that description. Also uh, low tech, low cells and Saturn, they helped a lot with the instrumented pile that I've shown you. And then finally, the APSRC and the Wind Africa project to help fund large portions of this project. And yeah, obviously, that was necessary for the equipment that got used. And yes, I think that's pretty much everything. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, thanks, Tiago. That's quite an interesting presentation. Uh, thank you very much for that. OK. Um, so with that, uh, I've opened the, the Q&A session, so you can start posting your, your questions. Uh, just one thing, please. I, I posted a link um, to a form to fill out for registration for CPD points. Um, when I posted the link, I noticed that there was a, an error on the setting on the link, so I posted it again. Please make sure you fill out the, uh, the attendance register for CPD points. Um, currently, I can see that uh, probably about 50% of the attendees have actually filled out the, the form. So please, even if you filled it in, just rather fill it in again just to make sure. Uh, no promises on doubling up on CPD points, but uh, pl please just fill it in. OK, um, with that, Tiago, we'll go to a, a couple of questions. Um, in fact, I, I had a question myself, if if I can ask, and you know, maybe maybe I'll post it so everyone can actually see it. Um, Tiago, if, if you can see it. Uh, um, okay, okay, maybe yeah. I can see it. Sure. Yeah, so how appropriate do you think it is to make spot predictions for design purposes, taking into account the accuracy of the various empirical method? Which is a, a good question. There's, doesn't really have a straightforward answer though, but I think in short, the thing to note is that they're all just an estimate and should be treated as such. They, they cannot and should not really be used without looking at the bigger picture, proper profiling and description of your structure and the fabric and all the rest of it. So yeah, I hope that vaguely answers a bit of the question. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's another question here, uh, which is, I mentioned repeatability issues with centrifuge testing. How bad is this? Well, I mean, it's not bad. I suppose it, it, it's like anything. It's how meticulous you are in preparation, in preparing your, your centrifuge tests. Um, by the time I presented, or by the time I performed those two tests, which or all those tests which had correlated so well, I did very many tests which failed miserably. miserably on different material types. So by the time it got to to those tests, I I was I had gotten quite good at it. So yeah, it's, it's basically like like anything really. You just need to practice and get it right. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, so there's a question here about correlations between CPT skin friction. Do I investigate the skin friction from in flight CPT versus skin friction measured in the pull-out test? I did not because the CPT was designed to not measure any uh, shaft friction. It was only measuring tip resistance. So that, that wasn't something that could be looked at. Um, 
Another question here is: Was excess pore were yeah were excess pore pressures measured when the pore pressure drops used it to determine the effect of the effect on shaft capacity, assuming that the piles were pushed in at various rates? So um, this is something that I think if I can answer this in two separate things. Pore pressures were measured, but this issue of inducing excess pore pressures is not one at least. I can speak for myself here. If you're dealing with an unsaturated soil, this whole issue of the development of excess pore pressures becomes a bit, bit more complex. If you have a fully saturated soil and you pull the piles out very quick, uh, relatively quickly, you'll get an increase in excess pore pressures because your, your pore water has nowhere to go, so you get that increase in pore pressure. In an unsaturated soil, you've got very compressible air, so your water does have places to go and air can compress and this will change things. And yes, so I mean, in short, I didn't look at, at what the effect might be, but it is something that is um, a bit more complicated to consider in an unsaturated soil, to my knowledge. I don't know if there's, if there's been any investigations on that. Um, another question here is, was there any preferential flow, flow down the piles during wetting? And if so, would that have had an effect on the measured capacity? I'm sure it would have had, a, had an effect on the measured capacity, um, but this is this is something that would be an issue at, at full scale as well. That uh, those tests, the way that the model was prepared, was the holes were all good, and rapid hardening grass was chucked on the hole with a, a threaded rod that was cast in the center of it, and so we tried to replicate. Um, an installation process to the best of our ability. Um, but I think preferential flow down, during, uh, down the sides of the pile is something that will be an issue in a centrifuge test or even at full scale. So it would have had an effect. Um, I, didn't, I didn't quantify the effect. Okay, Tiago, I haven't seen any new questions uh, popping up, but let, let's give it a, a few more moments before calling it. Um, sure. Please, anyone, if there's, there's questions, please. And uh, th thanks for completing the attendance register. I can see uh, more people have filled it out. My apologies again for that. Uh, so yeah, another question has popped up here. Does it pass? Not sure I completely understand the question. Um, the supported whole test. Well, I can answer the first bit of the question, which was uh, for the supported whole test, what was I expecting to find? My initial suspicions was that the supported and unsupported test wouldn't really have had an effect, um, which is what was confirmed. But it was just something that was done more for just to be sort of complete with the analysis so that no one could shoot it down, although I'm sure people will try. <laughs> It was just to, just to ensure that those suspicions were in fact correct. So, yeah. Um, Tiago, just while we're waiting for maybe a few more questions, um, you know, j just uh, obviously thank you for for giving your presentation to us today, and uh, you know, all, all the way from from the UK. Um, you mentioned the weather was about as good as we're having today. You said it's warm there. I am sitting here shivering today. <laughs> um, but yeah, just for for all the attendees as well, thank thank you for joining in today, and. Um,
please look out for um, information on the next evening lecture. We're looking at having the Dewatering Institute give a presentation probably around the 21st of July, but uh, all of this will be confirmed in the, the next couple of weeks. And um, obviously we'll, we'll forward all that on during the appropriate time. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions, Yaga. Um, again, someone once said to me, it's a sign of a good lecture that uh, there's, there's not many questions. So <laughs> I, I do see one question that just came in, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I see. Now let's have a look here. Okay. So, okay. The question is that the air entry, the air entry value is quite high. Should one not look at saturating the profile to prevent heave, as it will be difficult to go beyond the air entry value? So, just to to give everyone but back on the air entry value is the point on your soil water retention curve where your soil starts to desaturate. And on some of the curves that I presented, it was many megapascals. I can't remember exactly what the value was. So the question is here is that if I completely saturated the profile, um, it, would, it would sort of negate most of these problems because you wouldn't get heave. That is true, but uh, to try and get this thing to fully saturate throughout the entire depth, I think would be quite a task. Um, if I looked, I'm going to quote some values now and I'm sure I'll get some of them wrong. But if I looked at, I think it was the Greenfield centrifuge test, the amount of time required to achieve fundamental swell in this particular clay. Um, so that's fundamental swell, that's not even full saturation. If you scale that up using the relevant scaling laws for centrifuge modeling, I think it's equated to just over a year, so just over a year of constant flooding with water ponded on top of them to just get it to that point. So if you wanted to get this to a fully saturated state, I think that would be a uh, very difficult thing to achieve. It's not to say that um, this is what I've just mentioned now is applicable for all clays. I think with a different fabric, something that's a bit saltier or sandier, you may get a different answer, but that's my answer for that. And then, secondly, any practical tips on how to construct a void below a power cap? Um, well, I imagine whoever has asked this probably will probably um, have more tips than what I would. But what I've looked at through literature, uh, I'm sure a lot of people that, have, that are interested in this will have seen the case study that was published by a flight through a couple of papers at Little Power Station where uh, that gap. Uh, that void was um, had swell closed because um, the initial estimate of heave was way off and essentially what happened was the heave was predicted. Um, I don't know how, how that was done, but after that esti estimate was formed, they then went to the site and cut down a lot of blue gum trees before construction started and then this created a big change in water table which really they ended up getting a lot more swell than what anyone would have expected. Um, so, practical tip in that regard is beware of blue guns, I would say. Um, this is me coming from a place of, I don't know, any uh, particular experience in construction. But, yeah, it's difficult to give a, a blanket sort of practical tip for, uh, for how to size that wound. Okay, Tiago, um, I really, I, I don't see any new questions coming. Um, just to, to everyone, if, if there are questions that, uh, that maybe haven't been, been asked yet or that uh, haven't been answered, please, please forward the questions on to me. You, you have my email, brett.marchides at keller.com. Um, you, you know, I'll, I'll stay in touch with Tiago and we'll, we'll get back to you with, with answers to those questions if you have any. Okay, so so with that, Tiago, I think uh, I think we call it an evening for today. So um, you know, j just from my side, on behalf of all the attendees and the GeoDiv, that thank you very much for your time and and for your presentation, and thanks for agreeing to to give it to us. It it was really a really an interesting presentation. Um, thank you very much for everything. Yeah, thanks so much for for giving me the opportunity. Appreciate it. All right, awesome. Yeah. Okay, and then um, to all the attendees, thank you for joining. Um, have a wonderful evening further. Stay safe and uh, keep warm.
thanks again and bye for now.